Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Today, I'm going to be discussing Deadpool and Wolverine with my guest, Max Vincent. Welcome to the po- podcast, Max. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's 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 been a long time uh, coming. Uh, what three weeks now? We've we've uh, yeah. scheduled and rescheduled. And for those yeah. who don't know, I was sick. I was sick too. I had COVID, so. <laughs> oh, that, that's probably worse than what I had. It was just yeah. like a sinus stuff. But yeah, this has been three weeks in the making. And we also wanted to record after D- Deadpool had been out. Deadpool and Wolverine had been out for a while. So people, because we are going to talk about spoilers um, for the movie. And you'll have a spoiler warning for those who haven't seen it yet. If you're like waiting for it to come out on Disney Plus. I know that's been a big question. I'll, I'll answer that question up front. That's not coming until October or November, guys. He, you, you got to wait on that. There's no way it's coming next month. But all that put aside, you know, I'd love the, uh, I'd love to hear from you, Max, uh, about, um, you know, introduce yourself, tell people about who, who are listening or watching, uh, because I do put out uh, both audio and video, um, about yourself and your work. Sure. Well, I've been writing professionally about movies since 2020. Same. And, uh, I guess we're all locked down in our homes and, uh, try to find uh, a career, I guess. In this industry, I had just lost my job uh, in March 2020. And so it wasn't a very good uh, place that I was at, uh, I would say, with the pandemic when it began. But uh, I started writing about movies and I finished also, I, I was doing a degree in film studies at university, was moved online. I finished that online. Then I finished my, my video game studies degree at the University of Montreal as well. School uh, in person, it, resumed in person and virtual like it was like half and half in 2021 and then after that i was trying to figure out exactly where i was going to go because you know i started to write more and more about film uh in various publications like in session film like awards radar film speak the illuminati screen rant the playlist i mean a bunch of places basically and as i started to also do uh interviews with people like Mm -hmm. trying to get out of my comfort zone and doing interviews i figured Maybe I have a shot or maybe I have a future in journalism. So I decided to enroll in a graduate program in journalism at the University of Montreal as well. And I just graduated like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. You were talking <laughs> oh. on, on our uh, secret WhatsApp chat yeah. for our, uh, for those who don't know, we're <laughs> both part of the International Film Society Critics, which by the way is taking applications now. Plug, plug. Um, but uh, he... Uh, yeah, I saw that um, come through. What was it? Two weeks ago? Three weeks? Yeah, it was ago? two. It was two weeks ago. It was on Friday, August 9th. I had received my final grade. It was an A plus, which I'm very happy about. I don't want to brag, but I'm very happy about that because because I mean it, I'm an average because like, because my because I mean I mean my personal I could I'm I'm, I'm not going to get into childhood and stuff like that, but yeah. it was like just academically ten years ago I would get like like you can get zero f's and stuff like that but you don't get 11 percent in exams but i got 11 percent in exams <laughs> so now now you know i was uh i guess i turned my life around and uh i i i cared more and more about school and now i you know finished not only you know uh three university programs but uh, with a very high gpa which i'm very happy about and now i have to figure out you know the next part of my life but it's so it's all good. I'll figure it out eventually. But uh, yeah, it just it, it's it's crazy how it just kind of because of the accessibility that we had during COVID, like everything was virtual, that mm-hmm. my career in film criticisms <laughs> started to take off in, in ways that I just did not expect at all. Uh, um, And if I didn't say uh, already, congratulations. But yeah, it, it was an interesting thing. And maybe one day somebody will make a documentary about it. But there was a lot of access uh, in the film criticism space during 2020. For those brief uh, reminder who didn't know, um, like I had access to like Mulan, uh, the 2020 version from Disney, um, which was insane at the time, given I had just started reviewing things maybe like five or six months prior and stuff like, oh, what was it? Chemical Hearts or something like that from Amazon Studio. I, I think my- maybe I've never. Yeah. Uh, something like that. It was like with a uh, Lily Reinhardt or something. Uh, she was putting on a lot of work in the 2020s. I, I say like we're not in the 2020s still. But yeah, like Broken Hearts Gallery, stuff like that was just like access was off the off the charts. Yeah, I, like I almost got um, Black Widow, which was insane to me at the time because again, six months into reviewing things, I was getting screeners that 
I, I still can't believe I got. So, yeah. yeah it, and, and, and that's how it started for a lot of people. That's how it started. Like, okay, like we finally have an opening and build the contacts from there. And it just, I don't know, it just kind of took off. It was, it was weird. It was, it was a, 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 an era in which I do not want to relive again. However, it was also kind of a blessing in disguise uh, to have all that time to yourself at home. Yeah. And uh, I guess figure out where you want to go once everything started to open up again. And so, you didn't have to travel like four, three or four hours to a screen. Yeah. It could just click a link or email somebody and say, hey, I would like to see this, please. And thank you. Big corporate entity, please. Um, and nine times out of 10, you'd get access. Um, because it was such a desperate thing. And I think um, this is probably the point where I want to highlight, um, not to give get too off track on like the film criticism injury industry as a whole, but I do think it is important for me to note in my first episode back in months um, that I have noticed a lot of people quit um, and or have to like go to a quote, quote unquote real job over these past few months, uh, Aaron White um, is one that comes to mind. There's stuff in the games journalism industry. Uh, recently, Game Informer closed down because, well, I think mostly that was GameStop's greed, but that's a topic for another day. But yeah, there's so many places in journalists um, who even have Patreons that are um, having to close their doors, so to speak. So I'll just use this platform to say, hey, if you like somebody's work, please support them in whatever way. It doesn't even have to be financial. It could just be sharing a review you like. And I'm not saying that for my sake. I'm just saying that for the industry's sake as a whole, because a lot of people are having to, for lack of a better phrase, kind of uh, be beg for money. Yeah. Or I mean, that that's why I have a job outside of the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the the film criticism sphere because it does not pay the bills and that's yeah. the sad reality of the uh of the landscape we live in yeah it so i don't say that for my benefit although patreon.com slash awesome media but um i just say that for the industry as a whole because I've, that's something very concerning i've been seeing in the last five or six months and i'm writing ebook plug plug i guess I'm not trying to make this about me but i'm writing a book about how to get people started on um we're doing what i do so uh, hopefully whenever that comes out i'm writing an update on it um here on my patreon pretty soon uh but i hope to get that out at the end of the year so that people can really learn from the four years i've had of just sitting and doing this so anyways with those plugs out of the way i would Let's get back to the actual podcast. I, I could sit here and talk about the industry for all, all of long day. I really could. And maybe we could talk about that like in a um in a in, in a uh in a podcast where I think maybe we talk talk about it some some other time. I don't know. Because I do think it's something worth talking about. But um something I've started doing um with the new quote unquote new era of my podcast. Um is asking for recommendations like a film, TV show, book, what have you. Uh, maybe even like the new Sabrina Carpenter album, which is full of banger. I mean, I just saw a fantastic film yesterday called The Killer by John yeah. Woo, the 2024 uh, reinterpretation of his 1989 film. Uh, I think it is a incredible, incredible achievement in action filmmaking. And uh, just goes to show that this this guy this this innovator this visual poet if you will he still got it 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 received middling reviews but um i i, I vibe a lot with uh, how john woo shoots choreographed action and how he lets the actors faces and um you know micro expressions speak louder than words and i was just taken aback by how beautifully poetic and um, surprisingly more spiritually charged than the original was because the original film is a pretty grim, bleak movie that really cruelly punishes all of its protagonists, whereas the remake is more hopeful and uh, makes us believe a little bit in miracles. And I find, I find this movie to be pretty miraculous that uh, John Woo is still showing people how to, you know, shoot, choreograph, edit, uh, action. 
uh, in a way that is always very exhilarating to watch, even with the limitations of it being a Peacock original, which is um, which means it will never get a physical release, just like, fittingly enough, the original does not have a proper uh, physical or streaming release as well. That was weird because I haven't seen the original, which may make it not make sense that I asked for a screener uh, and did get one. I've just been really busy writing my Inside Out 2 review, which is a phenomenal film. It, it had no right being that good. But yeah, I'm, uh, that's on my screener list of things to watch. But yeah, I, I, I'm I'm hoping it's really good. Um, even if I haven't seen even not seeing uh, the 1989 original, although I, I really do want to see the 1989 original. It's just like not anywhere really, uh, not readily available is what I mean. Yeah, it's on the Internet Archive, so Ooh, plug, okay. plug. <laughs> okay. We're all plugging things today. But um, but yeah, I, well, I, I kind of have to check that out, out because I'm reviewing it. But um, but I'd, I I. Feel like I'd re- uh, I'd be checking that out regardless because you say John Woo and I'm there. You don't even have to finish the sentence. He's the man. Yeah. He's the man. He's the goat. He's the goat. Yeah. No, what is no it? one touches him. No one touches him. He's a, he's he, he's revolutionized this the sphere and he keeps doing it. He keeps he, he keeps finding new ways of just you know shooting action and 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 delivering a profoundly cathartic experience. And I I, I love his movies. I've I don't think I don't really like. There's one movie that I, of his that I don't like, and it's Mission Impossible Two. But yeah, I don't like that, Mission Impossible Two either. But, um, as as far as most of his movies are concerned, I I, I like most of them. I, I I vibe with them a lot, and I think he's a, he's a he's a fantastic uh, fantastic filmmaker. I mean, as long as he just you know keeps paying the Dove budget, you know, he's just gotta uh, pay in that budget. So, and I'm in. Like, if there's not a Dove in a John Woo movie, that it's not a John Woo movie. I mean, Silent Night does not have any doves, and so they come back. They make their grand return in this movie. I honestly forgot he directed that. Like for some reason, in my mind, it crosses uh, paths with the David Harbor Santa movie uh, that came out a few which years is, ago, which is called Violent Night. Yeah, it, those wires get crossed for me, and I just forget one of them exists at any moment. Um, it's like, oh yeah, there was a Joel Kinnaman uh, Santa movie. Directed by John Woo, like it was real weird there for a few years of just like violent Santa movies, and we're getting one well, this year uh, with a uh, Red One. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Which I don't want. I don't want to talk about that movie. It looks, <laughs> it looks awful. Yeah, it looks like a tax write off in progress. But, um, but yeah, with that said, let's uh, get into talking about Deadpool and Wolverine. And heads up, um, I do have a review out uh, there. And that will be the final plug of the podcast before. The outro, I promise. Just check it out if if you want to. It's a long read. Sorry about it. So first things first, let's talk a, a bit about our, our respective histories with the X-Men and uh, Deadpool and Wolverine movies because I kind of consider each of them their own three separate franchises. Like you've got X-Men, which has Wolverine in it, but the Wolverine like sub-franchise is a wholly different thing and so is Deadpool almost. Like, Deadpool's almost like slapstick action buddy comedy, and Wolverine's like the last Ronin on steroids, um, especially when you get to the Wolverine and Logan. Not so much x Men Origins Wolverine, but the less we talk about that, the better. Uh, um, but yeah, I'd just love to hear um, your history with the X-Men movies as a whole, Deadpool, Wolverine. Yeah, I mean, I... I'm I'm a big fan of the most of the X Men movies, not all of them. Like X Men Origins Wolverine is just just awful, <laughs> and there's, no, there's nothing else that can be said. It's just it's just terrible. I mean, it's it's kind of weird how this one introduced Deadpool um, in film, and it just completely <laughs> did everything that it should not do when it comes to introducing Deadpool in film sewing his mouth and then just completely desecrating the character like that it was just it was just terrible but it was also the the only time in which deadpool and wolverine actually teamed up and so this movie acts as a i guess uh i guess as a revision of you know them actually teaming up you know on screen but yeah i i i would say my favorite x-men movie is um x2 
X Men Unite. I've always always loved that movie, and I always um, I love the the opening uh, scene in the White House. And uh, it, it was I think the best live action treatment of the X Men on screen. But it's gone through a lot of you know a lot of permutation. Like there are some movies that are really good, and some movies that are just really 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 terrible. It's a fairly inconsistent franchise. And so when the news were announced that you know Disney were buying Fox. Obviously, well, I don't really like studio mergers, but one of the positives uh, of this whole deal is that, you know, X-Men is now finally going to be owned by Marvel Studios, and they're going to be able to do their own thing with the character. And I think, personally, that X-Men 97, which is the animated show on Disney+, Plus that premiered this year, is probably the best adaptation we've ever gotten of X-Men on screen. It's unbelievable how it just gets everything right about not only the characters, redeeming characters that were poorly treated on screen, like Cyclops, and also gets these uh, social messages uh, very right. You know, it's politically charged, and it's a very... It, it, it's, it's funny how it reflects the society we live in today more so than the movies did. The movies sort of briefly explored the parallels between, you know, being a mutant and uh, people that are ostracized in society, whereas the, the show X-Men 97 really explores that head on. And I thought to myself, well, if Marvel really nails the X-Men and X-Men 97, I think, you know, the live action versions of these characters are going to be in, in safe hands. Jury's still out because we haven't really had a proper X-Men movie. But uh, so far... Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not vibing the their live action uh, treatments of the characters so far. It it, it it's uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get to initial reactions of uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. But, yeah, I, I'm on that same level with you. X Men Two X uh, X Two X Men United is also one of my favorites. Not New Mutants. That was probably one. I of forgot the, about. I forgot about New Mutants. Probably one of my shortest reviews on the site. I. I had to force myself to write a review because I told Disney I would. I don't don't think they liked the review though because it was maybe like three paragraphs and like sixteen sentences, um, if that. Um, but yeah, the best is X two. Grew up uh, with Wolverine, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, so I think a lot of that um, kind of colored my perception of X Men Origins. To where I'm like, oh, we finally get a proper Wolverine film where it's just Wolverine and, you know, the blob and, uh, uh, yeah, Gambit was in that movie. Yeah. Uh, but like not the, well, we'll get into that later. But, um, but yeah, uh, it, 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 um, I think growing up with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine kind of colored that my experience of X-Men Origins and made me like it a bit more when I was a kid in 2009 where like the end credit scene with uh, Deadpool opening his eyes was like the most hype I had been that year. Granted, Re Transformers Revenge of the Fallen wasn't good, so it was kind of an off year for franchise movies. But uh, anyways, um, but yeah, I, I've always loved the X-Men movies. Uh, I don't think there's really a bad one except for apocalypse the new mutant and the original cut of days of future past oh, you mean the rogue cut no i well okay i guess i guess if we're playing that um it's called it's called the rogue cut yeah so i don't like the theatrical cut of uh days of future past the only version of it i watch is the rogue cut because it makes so much more sense when you've seen the rogue cut of like just just generally the whole movie makes a lot more sense at least to me at the time I I haven't seen it in a while but um but yeah um as for dead it's probably my favorite of the X-Men sub franchises um because um I think the the team Paul Wernick and Rhett Reese the writing team really latched onto the fact that yes this is a superhero movie but it's also about wade wilson as a person um more than it is about deadpool as a super so like the first deadpool i've probably seen that in theaters five or six times and deadpool 2 was okay i didn't really dig the whole x-force stuff you know um it, they it, it it is what it is 
you know, it, you got to go bigger for the sequel. Um, and yeah, that we're at Deadpool three and all that. I don't think, um, and I'll get into this a little bit later when we start talking about specifically Deadpool Wolverine. I don't think this really makes a Deadpool three. Um, I think it m makes more of a Deadpool two point five, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on. Yeah, X Men films I haven't been bad. Um, with with a few notable exceptions like X Men Wolverine, New Mutants, and stuff like that, and even like Apocalypse was just like fun track. The only one I refuse to see is Dark Phoenix, and that's just like a like yeah, a that one's I, terrible. Like I saw the trailer and I was like, yeah, I can smell the uh, impending doom of the X Men franchise all over that trailer because it came out like the same year or so that the Fox merger happened with Disney going forward. Um, and we'll get into this a bit later. I'll, 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 uh, I'll be interested to see what happens with the X-Men in the MCU. We've obviously had X-Men in the MCU for three years now, I think, because it starts with like Miss Marvel. They're like, Hey, you're a mutant. And they play like the X-Men, uh, 97 thing. And then, um, Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness has a bunch of X-Men, um, and then the Marvels obviously has Beast and all of them in the, there in the X Mansion. So um, I'll be interested to see what uh, what happens with it going forward. But I guess let's use that to talk about our expectations and initial reactions for Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, you go first um, so I can kind of collect my thoughts on it. All right. Well, I will say. When they announced the movie, you know, Deadpool was going to be in the MCU. Makes sense. Uh, I was excited. I, I I enjoyed the first two Deadpool movies. I didn't think the second one was uh, better as uh, better than the first one. It had its issues, but I still had a good time with it. And so, you know, I was looking forward to it. I I enjoy Ryan Reynolds' take on Deadpool, though I think that the characters that he's played outside of Deadpool have just been sort of Deadpool knockoffs and he's yeah. kind of been boring nowadays, but that's a story for another time. And when they announced that Hugh Jackman was back as Wolverine, I wasn't mad about it. Some, a lot of people were, cause they were like, Oh, he's destroying the legacy of Logan and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's fine. They've always wanted to do a team up between Deadpool and Wolverine. It'll make sense in the movie. Who cares? And I think, um, as far as I'm concerned, I would love to see a team up between Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool because uh, we've never had it and we might have never gotten it, but now we're getting it. So I think, you know, that should be that should be pretty interesting. And they announced uh, who's going to direct it and uh, alarm bells started to ring. I don't like Sean Levy at all. Um, I've, I've not. That does not mean that I've not liked all of his movies. I have a soft spot for Big Fat Liar and for The Night of the Museum. Uh, films as well. I think they're fun. But I don't think he's a director with a distinguishable sense of style. I think he's, you know, he's sort of a fairly boring uh, filmmaker who who's pretty much like a yeah, pretty much acts like a yes man for the studio, like he did in, in Free Guy. You know, like that final act of I didn't think Free Guy was that terrible, but the final act of that movie where they reference a bunch of you know Disney sub brands was um, off and um, I thought well this is, we're basically going to get Free Guy 2.0 with this movie and so I wasn't that thrilled over it but you know, you know whatever trailers came out didn't do anything for me at all I uh, didn't think the movie looked great but you know it's a trailer it's not a movie and so I go see the film in IMAX uh, 3D really really enjoyed the opening uh, credits scene, especially in IMAX 3D because things really just fly out of the screen. Yeah, There's I was wondering neat, about that. This this neat uh, frame break effects, like you know, you got the black bars at the top and the bottom of the screen, and things just pop out of the pop pop out of the frame. It's it's kind of cool, right? It's 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 a bit of a gimmick, but it's 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 cool nonetheless. And the movie took a I don't know really sour turn for me, and I, I I did not I did not like this movie at all. I think it's I think it's terrible, and I think it's it's the worst. Uh, not only the worst Deadpool movie, but the worst uh, MCU movie. I think it's worse than Thor: Love and Thunder. It's not as bad as uh, Secret Invasion. Secret Invasion remains the worst thing Marvel has ever done. Like, there's yeah. nothing. I don't. I don't think anything will ever beat that. I mean, th th that finale was indescribably terrible. And, uh, I was not. I. 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 I I find it weird how much I've really enjoyed the first two Deadpool movies, and here I, w I was just not vibing with this movie like one bit. It looks terrible. 
Uh, and it's all about just jingling keys in front of an audience's face, but there's no there's no real story. There's no emotional depth behind it. It just it's, it was just it was just boring. And I was like, well, have I fallen out of love with the superhero movies, or have the superhero movies just you know gotten really bad? I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens with uh, you know future future Marvel titles. But you know, X Men '97 was so good that I thought maybe you know this was going to be as good and i just yeah i wasn't a fan uh at all i think it's uh, i think it's a bad movie and uh, i'm happy to, to talk about it uh further so this will make an interesting discussion then because if, if you see my review you know i rate this movie really highly not because of i i, I think because of how it made me feel for for starters i, I guess i'll start with expectations it's like I, my expectations going into this movie were pretty low um because I'm like, okay, it's not called Deadpool three. I'm not. I probably shouldn't expect like Deadpool three, because they are very um, explicit about that fact. It's like, no, this is not Deadpool three. This is just Deadpool and Wolverine, and you kind of feel that throughout the film. It's Deadpool's universe, quite literally, and this isn't giving anything away. Is on hold. The entire movie. They don't deal with any of the characters from the previous Deadpool uh, movies until the end of the movie. And it's like, okay, so this is more about um, things I won't spoil. Um, I'm trying to do dodge and weave spoiler territory here. But um, I'll just say it's like the celebration of legacy um, really is... is the best I can do without spoiling certain elements of it. And to the uh, elements of uh, Sean Lee, um, I think I knew kind of what to expect when he was announced. It, announced like I saw Free Guy and yeah, it, and all the featurettes for Deadpool, Wolverine, and I'm like, yeah, I kind of know. It, like, ha have you ever seen him talk about Deadpool, Wolverine? Like in interviews, he'll always be like, yeah. "Oh, oh, that's so Deadpool," and he's just got this like really corporate synergistic. Yeah. All right, so where was I? Uh, I'll just say that. Um, anyways, sh when John Levy was announced as the director, you kind of get the sense that yeah, like to your point, corporate synergy is a huge thing for him because in any interview he's ever given, like whether I come across it on TikTok or the official Marvel Studios account or Marvel Entertainment, you know, any of their uh, socials, um, he's always like, that is so Deadpool. And he's just like really excited about it, which I can't knock. But also at the same time, I'm like, dude, we're going to see your movie. You've got billions of box office. You're good. You don't have to like be so excited about every project. It it, it kind of is alarming. It, I, I I don't like to talk bad about people. However, is he like is his family under lock and key from Marvel Studios PR or something? Like, is he the fear in his eyes is just like if that's not a performance, I don't know what it what it is. But anyway, that aside, I think Levy, I, I think Levy knows how to tap into and i think why reynolds chose him is because he worked with him on free guy and um the adam project is i think what levy does well he he's able to tap into both the emotional side of of a story and also deliver on action now, do i think sean levy directed those action sequences no i think that's like a second uh ad or something like that like i don't think he directed those but anyway uh, that's beside the point uh I don't think Sean Levy's direction is fantastic, but I do think um, it it does well enough. I, I, I don't really feel like there were any real choices made, if that makes sense. But at the same time, I, I also recognize this is a big uh, franchise. Like, I don't feel... Um, to give a Marvel director comparison, like I I don't feel that Anthony and Joe Russo are gonna make that much of an impact on Avengers Doomsday and Secret War. Like I don't think I'm gonna feel their touch on that movie, if that makes sense. Uh, especially since they you know didn't write the script for the other um, Marvel movies leading up to Avengers Doomsday, like they did for. Captain America Civil War Winter Soldier, but that's neither here nor there. But but yeah. But yeah. And then I, I guess addressing um 
kind of something we've both both brought up um is it uh being deadpool 3 versus deadpool 2.5 so i want to discuss that really quick i don't think deadpool and wolverine feels very natural of a step for after deadpool 2 like it just feels like again i keep referring to it as a deadpool 2.5 which I'm fine with, you know, this is the first step into the MCU. You've kind of got to celebrate um, who Deadpool is and, you know, before you get into the nitty gritty, like, oh, who's Storm in this universe? Who's Beast in this universe? Who's... Why am I thinking of more? I think it's maybe because you mentioned X-Men 97, which is on my watch list, by the way. Uh, I've just been meaning to watch X-Men the Animated Series first before I watch X-Men 97. Anyways, but yeah, I just... I just felt like this was Deadpool 2.5 by virtue of having to have a meta entry, well, a literal meta, meta entry into the MCU of like, hey, we also recognize that we are entering the Mar uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe after being marooned at Fox for um, 19, 20, 30 years, something like that. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, well... I think, you know, I think it's fine for, uh, you know, Deadpool to continue the story that they've told within the Fox X-Men movies and bringing them to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think it makes sense also because they've also introduced the concept of the multiverse uh, throughout, you know, post-Endgame. Uh, so it's, you know, it's fine. It makes sense for the viewer to say, well, okay, well, Deadpool is in an alternate universe. He's going to the MCU and, you know, that's how they're going to bring him in, you know, but you know, at the same at, at at the same time, I don't particularly you know think it's that interesting of a of a story. But, um, you know, it's uh, we could talk about that later on, but it's just you know it's 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 father for just a bunch of cameos that mean nothing uh, because we have little to no emotional connection with the characters that you know uh, appear in this movie. But I don't want to get too much into that because that could be a spoiler. Yeah, I'll just, you know, piggyback off of that. Um, you know, talking about motion when it comes to cameos without spoiling things. I I think it goes back to the idea of the whole movie's theme of legacy and what legacy means about and I, they do get kind of um on the nose on about it sometimes. Like there are specific lines where it's like where it's explicitly stated to the audience. Like leg legacy is a line I heard probably twenty or thirty times. I'm like, okay, I get it. But uh, in reference to, to the cameos, which I won't spoil, although the cast and crew had no problem spoiling them within like twenty four hours, actually less than that. But um, but I did feel like they're impactful. But but I I guess more so than in Doctor Strange, where instead of Doctor Strange 2, where that was like, hey, here are these guys for like five minutes and they're gone. It's like you get an entire act with those cameos. I'll just say that. Um, so that's why I guess they made, made more of an impact to me. Um, but, but I'm probably getting way too far into spoiler territory. So I'm just going to hit the reverse button on that and we'll get out of the spoiler territory. So, um, but yeah, to... I don't think it's natural um, at all. And to, to your um, thing about like the, you could um, have a Deadpool 3 in this universe, I actually don't disagree. I, I think you do have, there could have been a Deadpool 3 where like, here's my dream Deadpool 3. Like you do it a lot like you do Deadpool and Wolverine, right? But like all the characters come along with Deadpool on the ride, like on the multiverse hopping journey so that way it's a lot more impactful when the uh, stakes get raised and also i don't know maybe follow some, some of the comic book journeys of these characters like um vanessa is a superhero in the deadpool comics and yet nothing is done with her here even though they were trying to do um adapt that story of her way back in Deadpool 2, and it's almost why she didn't come back for Deadpool 2, uh, because they wouldn't adapt the comic book story um, of Vanessa. But yeah, I, I, I do think 
there could have been room for Deadpool 3 uh, in this Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, especially when we're talking about legacy. And, you know, it could have just been like, hey, this is the final film in a trilogy. And you could have, you know, celebrated that fact of like, hey, at the end of this film, you could have had something where it's like, here's to a new chapter uh, of Deadpool and the MCU. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but getting to the titular characters, how did you feel about Hugh Jackman and, uh, and Ryan Reynolds? I don't know why I blanked out on his name for a second, but, uh, how did you feel about their performances in the film together? Did they work together, um, after spending nearly 10 years in X-Men Origins territory, uh, in, in purgatory there, or, uh? Did it not work as well for you? Well, the fundamental problem I have with this movie is that, you know, the Wolverine that audiences grew up with, you know, his story ended uh, pretty tragically in Logan, you know, and so they've developed an emotional connection with them, you know, for, you know, sort of about, I think, a lot, for, I think the first X-Men came out in 2000, you know, for 17 years, because Logan came out in 2017, and that neatly wraps up the story. And the Wolverine that we have in Deadpool and Wolverine is not that Wolverine. It's a Wolverine from another yeah. universe. So there is no, there is zero, zero emotional connection that we have with this Wolverine because it's a completely different iteration of the character that's just there for, you know, Marvel Studios and I guess Hugh Jackman also to wear the yellow suit because he never wore the yellow suit in the X-Men movies. You know, they teased it in the extended cut of the Wolverine at the end, the yellow suit, but he never wore it. And so this, you know, in this movie, he wears it. He wears the mask, he wears the yellow suit, and that's, that's Wolverine is there. He doesn't really do much too, right? Even with, um, with, with Deadpool, he's kind of sidelined for most of the film. And Deadpool is pretty much just the center of attention. And even when we get these big moments uh, with Wolverine, they fall flat because the movie looks awful. It's a horrendously designed film. There is no sense of visual style. The action, I mean, it's rated. This is even more mind-boggling because this is Marvel's first R-rated movie. And so I'm expecting it to be, like, violent, as violent or more violent as the other Deadpool movies. And yet we can't see a damn thing. The action just cuts away. It's haphazardly edited. It's shakily shot. And, it, you know, it, it, there's no sense of, you know, real legitimate direction in the action and so yeah i i i found the chemistry between jackman and reynolds to be fairly fairly frictionless because again we have no discernible connection with whoever is um uh you know uh, portraying wolverine because it's not the wolverine we know and love i i think that's actually a great point um because i think when you first start to see, I, I think it was the Super Bowl trailer last year. Was that how long ago the first trailer was? I guess uh, how Super recent. Bowl, Super Bowl trailer that came out this year yeah, oh, in February. Oh, that, that recent. Okay. For some reason, I was thinking like last, last year. And you see, well, I don't think you see the yellow and blue suit. What, whatever suit the yellow and blue suit shows up, in, immediately I jump to, oh, they're bringing the X-Men 97 uh, Wolverine into it. But Hugh Jackman's face, because obviously Hugh Jackman has to be in the suit. Otherwise, you know, you don't get box office receipts. I, I, I think if you would put, um, like many people rumored, Daniel Radcliffe in the suit, um, I think that would have not been a good look. But I also don't make the big decisions like that. So who knows? So they could have even cracked it like a Harry Potter joke. But, um, but yeah, I... I um. Yeah, I I think I agree with you that not having Hugh Jackman this uh be that Logan from the X Men films and us having to and I don't even know this is if this is spoiler territory so stop me if I get too spoilery that we really don't know anything about him until like the third act like there's just this um big third act reveal who who this version of Wolverine is and it's like okay. I feel like that should have come way earlier, maybe in the first act when we're meeting him. When, um, because really, like you said, we have no emotional attachment. However, I do, I do think 
there's this weird scenario where a lot of the times where I was watching this movie, I was like, I, I was placing him in the X-Men black and ye uh, yellow uniform a lot of the time. I was just like, oh, yeah, I, I don't know what it is about that, but I was just like uh, attaching him as, no, 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 this could just be like the pre uh, Days of Future Past timeline uh wolverine like just trying to make arguments in my head to make it make sense but yeah i think that's a salient point um actually and actually probably something i probably should have thought about uh in my review because it didn't i don't think it hit me until just now that it wasn't the same wolverine because i had put put so much emphasis on well it's hugh jackman so it's like kind of the same wolverine maybe it's like the one who didn't fix the timeline in days of future past or you know something like that so that's an actually interesting thing to point out but yeah and i think um as far as our chemistry goes going back to that i would have is it weird to say i wish this would have been three hours I, I wish it was not three hours i wish it was just two minutes because this movie's unbearable but okay. you do you <laughs> and maybe that's because i um because I think there's like a large portion of this movie that feels cut out of the movie. Like there feels like an hour missing from this movie, like at least. I don't know if you got the same vibes from it, but I definitely was like, hey, there's definitely more movie in here, but it just kind of skips forward. But maybe we'll get into that uh, in a spoiler discussion. I don't know. But with that, I guess... How did you feel about the tone of this movie? I know we talked about like it kind of being cameo filled, but a lot of the focus of these Deadpool movies has been humor and action. Those have been the two vital ingredients. Do you think it even did that uh, good, uh, correctly, or or is it as bad as Once Upon a Deadpool in that department? I think um, in Deadpool two, David Leach, uh, who I don't think is a great director, but he knows how to shoot, choreograph action very well and all of his movies all of his action sequences are uh very good you know like even the fall guy which i wasn't too crazy about has some really good action sequences and i think he gave gave the blueprint for subsequent filmmakers that handled deadpool how to do it because the action sequences in his films and in deadpool 2 had you know lots of color we could see everything was going on it was gritty you know it was also playful because you know deadpool's a playful character and so some of the I guess, horriest or gnarliest moments of that film is played for laughs and within reason. None of that is in Deadpool 3. First and foremost, this film is set in The Void, which is fine. In Loki season one, The Void looks like, you know, an actual lived-in wasteland. And it's got this green hue, and it's actually quite tantalizing to look at. Whereas The Void in Deadpool and Wolverine just looks like an empty, drab, uh, flat space uh with just absolutely no tangible meaningful stakes and they stick the characters in the void for most of the runtime you know most of the action in that environment is completely meaningless because you know no one knows this is actively happening at the same time the action isn't even shot compellingly like i said it's shakily like the, this big you know the big cameo filled battle I couldn't see a damn thing could you see a damn thing that was going on? I couldn't see any like any move made by the characters. It's they were they were shakily shot and they were really they were really horrendously cut together. I was like, what like what is going on? Like what, what am I supposed to like where am I supposed to center my eye in? And even the the, the fight between Deadpool and Wolverine at the beginning in the void with the Fox logo just kind of you know it it feels artificial. It doesn't feel tangible. And even the 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 minivan uh fight scene which is a, a one or kind of a one or just i don't know it doesn't stylistically it didn't really grab me and, uh you know there's a lot of there's there's also a i guess a, a tribute to old boy in the last act of the movie where deadpool and wolverine fight off the deadpool corpse and even then i was like okay well side scrolling on a, the fakest set imaginable the cgi is not very good and uh yeah I, I was just i was just really unimpressed with how it choreographed and shot at the action and as as far as the comedy goes i i i wasn't vibing with the comedy at all there was a lot of really dated jokes like you know a will oh a will smith slap joke in 2024 how original yeah that uh, was weird even just fourth wall breaks or 
it, it, if it didn't feel as fresh as in the other Deadpool movies. And there's, there's, you know, it's, it's interesting how it talks about corporate synergy, but this entire film is based off corporate synergy because it would have been, it wouldn't have been possible had Disney not bought Fox. So there's a bit of a sinister <laughs> vibe going on into it. And it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel as funny Disney mocking themselves because they bought Fox as it would have been had Deadpool made a joke about Disney in a Fox produced film. And it, for me, it just, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't too into it. I, I found it pretty unfunny. Almost, I mean, some of it, some of it was, was pretty funny, but you know, most of it was fairly flat and, and just, I, I was not enjoying myself at all. I'll be on the opposite end of the, I laughed a ton, maybe because my chimpanzee ma monkey brain was going off all the time, but, and sometimes, you know, that's what I like, it, except for when it's Twisters. Don't, don't watch that movie. I'm not going to review that movie. Don't even ask. One of the worst, maybe one day, maybe, maybe one day, but anyway, yeah, I, I don't think the, hu I think the humor did okay. Um, but talking about the, uh, specifically the merger jokes, I think the humor was at its best when it wasn't being self-referential. Um, I think the funniest joke out of the movie is when um, the first wall break uh, that's happened. And I don't think this is really a spoiler because it's not even like a plot thing where Deadpool starts talking to the camera and saying he's going to go to Disney World or Disneyland, wh whichever one, and, and grabs like a mic and and tells fox to suck it like that was one of the probably the funniest jokes in the movie because it actually acknowledged this or acknowledged the situation without being overt about it i guess if that makes sense when i mean over i, I over is when they're like in front of the fox logo and they don't even mention like anything about there being a huge 20th century fox logo behind them like the other Deadpool movies would have one hundred percent made a joke out of that because I mean they've made jokes about the X Men timeline they've made joke about the different um, Charles uh, Xavier actors and things like that and Hugh Jackman's retirement as Wolverine I think that humor was much better in the Fox produced Deadpool movies uh, and by the way this is still twentieth century studios uh, produced movie by the way I don't know if people knew that. Like, if you look on the poster, it'll say 20th Century Studios and Marvel presents Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, and there's a 20th Century copyright at the bottom, not a Marvel copyright like the um, Iron Man and the um, other Marvel movies, that, um, which is a tidbit I did not know until I saw the credits of the movie. But as far as the tone goes, I will agree that um, I, I I will overall agree that the Fox produced movies were better at balancing the tone. I I, I do think what this movie does well though is um, really bringing a lot more emotion to it um, than be, being jokey all the time. Deadpool two was very jokey, and perhaps to its detriment. Like there's the famous clip of. Brad Pitt showing up for 0.5 seconds uh, in Deadpool 2. And I'm like, okay, that's a funny joke the first time you see it, but what happens the fifth time? The sixth. Um, and as somebody who's seen Deadpool 2 six times, it gets kind of old. And maybe, I don't know, maybe Deadpool and Wolverine gets old on the sixth time. But, um, so I guess overall I agree, but also disagree at the same time. <laughs> uh, as complex as that may sound, but but yeah, and then I guess since we're already comparing it to the other films, how do you think it stacks up against these other films like X Men and or Wolverine's movies or the MCU and as a whole? Well, I I think I think uh, Deadpool one and two are way better than this. They at least had you know they, they at least nailed the tone of the character. They at least gave some really good action sequences, and they weren't too reliant on cameos. Like the Brad Pitt cameo was fun because it was unexpected. You now, like no, like the Vanisher. Oh, it's the Vanisher. He's invisible, and then oh, he gets electrocuted. It's Brad Pitt's face. That's weird. You know, like no one expected it, and it was fun. But in in in, in the case of this movie, it's you know, it's just it's just driven by cameos. It's just driven by how many things that you can point and clap at the screen because you can recognize. It's, it's not necessarily because you have an emotional connection to it, and we'll get to that once once there are spoilers. You know, it's just 
I, I, I found it, you know, to be more egregious than the other Deadpool movies, which were, which were fun. You know, they were fun movies. They're, I, th- I think Ryan, Re- Ryan Reynolds deserved to treat Deadpool like he did in those movies because they did him so dirty in X Men Origins Wolverine. His performance wasn't bad. It was just how they treated the character was, you know, sacrilegious. But as far as I'm concerned, this movie's not good. Uh, it does not stack up against the rest of the MCU. I think uh, the MCU is at a very low point when it comes to its movie. And uh, I was not at all, like, I, I was surprised at how much I disliked uh, the movie because I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Deadpool. I, I've read the Deadpool comics. I love X-Men. I love, you know, I love Jackman's take on, on Wolverine as, as well. And just no, pretty much nothing worked for me. <laughs> like, if if I'm able to, you know, pinpoint exactly what I liked, but what I didn't like, it was, was I, I'm, I'm more often than not drawn to what I didn't like and, and what I just found very, very irritating in this film. So, I think I would rank this, I'll go fourfold. I'll go first X-Men films. I think this probably ranks just below Days of Future Past for me. Um, and that's like the bottom half of the X-Men movies for me. And then for Deadpool, this is obviously the worst of, of the three. Oh, okay. Once upon a Deadpool is below because that that was just bad. This is like, hey, let's t- tell Deadpool to super duper cut, but also just pointless cash grab. Anyways, um, and then for Wolverine films, I feel like that's a high standard, but obviously it goes like before X Men Origins. Obviously, I, the 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 below like nothing can ever touch how bad X Men Origins is. Except New Mutants, except New Mutants. That that that's probably like the bottom of the X Men barrel. Then as for MCU movies, I think probably middle of the pack um, for me, just because there are so many better MCU movies. Not even including the Disney Plus shows, which if we're including the Disney Plus shows, it, it goes farther down, probably like seven, uh, probably like seventy per. Five percent of the way down. I'll maybe like attach screenshots on social media or something like that to actually visualize what I'm talking about, but uh, or include lists in the show notes. But um, but yeah, I probably yeah probably about seventy five percent of the way down the list uh, for that one. All right, folks. Before we delve into some spoilerific uh, territory, uh, here's a quick heads up for those who haven't seen Deadpool Wolverine yet. We're about to discuss the plot and unanswered questions from the film shortly. So if you prefer to avoid spoilers, uh, I'll include a timestamp in the show description, episode description, uh, labeled final thoughts and social media plugs that you can click and uh, skip to that section uh, in in the episode description. So with that said, uh, Max, let's get started on spoilers. Oh, I... I guess let's talk first about the plot twists and surprises. Anything surprise you? No. Okay. I mean, I mean, okay, I mean, good. I mean, the only, the only thing that surprised me was they did the, I guess we call it a bait and switch with Chris Evans, as character. Yeah. He's introduced as cap. Immediately. I was like, oh, it's Johnny storm. It's too, it's, it's, they're, they're making it too obvious. And, uh, cause you know, he does a superhero landing and yeah. Deadpool props, props him up as cap. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm smart. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you. And then he says flame on and it's like, okay, yeah, there you go. And, you know, and I guess it's cool. I guess it's cool to to see him, you know, in the MCU again after he said he wasn't going to come back. So just for this, I think that was that was neat. But again, it's indicative of a larger problem that I'll talk about sooner. Yeah. You know what I didn't understand about that scene entirely? So you can clearly see his van braces blue and red, right? When he takes the cloak off, they go. They disappear. Where, where, yeah. where are the blue and red van braces? Yeah, like well. I would, I would have given them props if there was like blue and red van braces on the Fantastic Four suit, because that actually would be kind of a nice way to kind of blend the uh, Ultimate Universe Human Torch in with the 2000s era Fantastic Four uh, Human Torch. But yeah, that 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 scene specifically, I almost jumped up. Because I love those Fantastic Four movies, unironically. Nobody will ever get me to hate those movies. Even Silver Rise of the Silver Surfer, which, yes, bad movie, but the action scenes freaking rock. I mean, the Human Torch with, like, the Thing hand, like, on fire, that's just goaded for me. That's just... 
But anyway, as far as uh, plot twists and surprises, yeah, uh, there aren't any. Um, as soon as Cassandra Nova gets introduced, I'm like, oh, I know your whole deal. I've read the comics you're introduced in, and I know exactly how this is going to go down. I do think that there could have been some more narrative stitching going on. Uh, like, for example, I, I guess we can get into the cameos now that we're in spoiler territory. How does she know how to contact the Deadpool Corps? This, there's somebody that's, they're a group that's uh, alluded to very early on in the film and then it's just like oh now they're here it's like well okay but like how, logistically how was contact made like she doesn't have a cell phone i don't think cell phones would work in the void either but also she could call the tva I, that whole that whole plot line where paradox calls pyro in the void even though the void and the tva are devoid of time is is flabbergasting to me that was the one where i was like okay my suspension of disbelief i kind of checked it out the door but this is too much you're talking about metaphysical things that even no amount of explaining can do that is just too much for me the whole like hey you're supposed to believe that um a telephone can reach through time and space but sure why not and then i Let's just get right into the cameos and Easter eggs. Which were your favorites and why? I feel like none of them, but none of them. Yes, no. no. I, I, you know, I find it, I, I find it weird that Marvel thinks people are going to get excited over the prospect of having people like Elektra and like Ch Channing Tatum, Scambit uh, appearing in the movie when there is no emotional connection to these characters. As far as I'm concerned, that Elektra movie was terrible. I Probably the it. worst. It's probably the worst Marvel movie ever. And so, yeah, I guess, oh, Jennifer Garner played Elektra, but the movie was not good. So no one ever developed an emotional connection with her. But because, oh, she played Elektra, there she is. And same thing with, you know, Channing Tatum's Gambit. They're giving him a redemption arc because he never got a chance to play Gambit. But mm -hmm. for those that weren't in the loop, at the time that there was a Gambit project that was being developed. None of this makes any sense as to why he's there and why he's playing Gambit. And therefore, all the jokes that he has about, oh, I'm about to name, uh, make a name for myself here or whatever, you know, it's it's it makes sense for people that, are, that have been following the development of that movie, but it doesn't make sense for anyone else. It's like, why is he playing Gambit? Why is he making all these jokes about him not being born yet, not really knowing where he's from? You know, there's no legitimate connection again. Uh, that we have with these people. X-23, another cameo that, um, you know, people were excited about. This is not the Logan that she was with. It's completely different Logan. And so the, the fireside chat that they have with them is poignant, I guess. You know, it's a little emotional. But again, it's not the Wolverine that she hung out with during Logan, but it's the same X-23 as in the Logan movie. And so they, they reunite. They have a reunion for nostalgia's sake. But it makes no sense because it's not, it's not the same. It's not the same character. So none of like none of the emotional beats have any sort of meaning. They all fall flat. And I guess I felt something when Blade appeared because I love Wesley Snipes' take on the character. I think he's he's really good in in all of those movies. But again, it doesn't really make sense for him to be here, uh, other than you know people pointing and clapping at the screen because they recognize characters. And it's cool. It's cool, I guess, for a moment. Remove that. Remove, you know, Henry Cavill appearing for no fucking reason at all as Wolverine, other than for Blu-ray Angel to yell, hey, yeah, because he's been fucking clamoring. Sorry, I'm swearing, but he's been clamoring for, uh, you know, Henry Cavill to play Wolverine in the MCU for God knows how many years. But like, why is he there? Again, just for people to go, oh, my God, like, like, there's, there's not, there's nothing there. There's no, like, you remove the cameos from the film and there's the movie has absolutely nothing going for it and again that whole big sequence that he has with all the characters is just so haphazardly shot and edited it's, it kind of feels insulting that you know people are watching this and going this is a, like the action's amazing i'm like really like compared to the second movie but really great action this is like it's it's night and day and uh yeah and oh one last thing i wanted to say was that you know spider-man no way home a lot of people you know have their opinions on the movie I think the cameos work because there's a purpose. 
You know, there's a purpose for them to be in the film. There's a purpose for Toby McGuire and Andrew Garfield. They, they, they give them an emotional arc, and they give our Peter Parker, Tom Holland, you know, an emotional arc as well. Like, he's not the same Spider-Man that he was in the at the beginning of the film than in the film's ending. He's gone through a lot, and he's only learned that by hanging out with the other Spider-Man uh, in, uh, in, in the movie, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, even, you know, making mistakes by, you know, trying to redeem the villains when it might have not been possible. It's, you know, it, it, it gives them a purpose for being there. There is no purpose for any of the any of the cameos for them to be there, other than to jingle keys in people's faces. And you know, I guess I've 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 moved past the point of enjoying keys being jingled at my face at my face, and I just I find it boring nowadays. Yeah, um, I think I, in this case, I actually did enjoy the jingle of the keys uh, because it was like, hey. You remember when superhero movies were like just goofy? Here you go. Here, here's the goofy uh, superheroes again. I was like, okay, I'm I'm in. Goof. Let's do goofy superhero movies again. Sure, why not? I don't think every um, superhero movie needs to be so serious. Now, granted, I understand the irony of me saying that in a Deadpool movie. I think we already know how I feel about some of the cameo uh, appearances. I love Johnny Storm. Because I grew up with that Fantastic Four. Well, I guess everyone kind of did, right? I mean, that was the only Fantastic Four that's ever happened other than the Roger Corman thing that's now lost to time, I think. And that was like, I think back in the 60s or was that the 90s? I, I can't remember. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love that. Um, yeah, to, to your point of, of uh, Blade and... I wanted to say Wolverine, Electra. I think, yeah, they don't work for me either. Probably because I don't have much of a, an emotional attachment to them, even as Fox characters. Like, I probably watched Blade a handful of times and never cared to watch the sequels of Blade. or And I never cared enough about Electra after Daredevil 2005 to be like, okay, yeah, let me watch her spinoff film. Same thing with uh, the cat the DC Catwoman thing from like 2006 or 2007, whenever that was. Um, but yeah, and to your point about Calvarine, I think they credit him as. The one thing that makes no sense to me, and again, I know I have checked my disbelief at the door, but I have a very analytical brain, okay? The pump arms before he pumps his claws the ad you have adamantium skeleton sir that's going to hurt when you do, do that little pump thing because now you're bending a rigid skeleton that's not that's gonna hurt really bad i don't know why that makes me so upset but like i get it's a reference to the mission impossible um what was it rogue nation fallout fallout i think um when he pumps his arms before fighting somebody but like as a Wolverine, uh, doesn't make sense because you literally have retractable claws inside your body. The only thing, what other cameos were there? Like, oh, Gambit. The audience's reaction to Gambit, I thought I had lost my mind. The quietest that theater had been the whole movie when he starts making the jokes. And I'm like, no one has a connection with him. And I'm looking around like, do you not understand what this man, man has been through? Like, I had to explain it to my mom afterward. Like, all the jokes that he was making. Like, uh, Deadpool makes a joke of, like, uh, lives you wanted to save or, or never could save. Or, like, basically makes a bunch of jokes at the fact that there was never a Gambit movie. And I had to explain those jokes to my mom after the movie because she didn't get them. I think... And I think that's one area where I think the cameo kind of failed. Um, because it's like, okay, well, unless you are following, like you said, if unless you are following that very specific news in like 2009 all the way till now, because uh, a reminder for listeners slash watchers, um, a Gambit movie was going to be going into production at the time of the Disney Fox merger. But then the merger happened and Fox said, no, 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 we're pausing all projects. 
uh, that were going to go into production until the merger goes through. And and Marvel looked at Gambit and was like, do we really need a Gambit movie? So it was a little weird of a cameo to have. As for uh, cameos, I think would have made the movie better and has was um, apparently going to happen at one point. I would have loved Ghost Rider in this movie. That would have made more sense to me if we're going wacky superheroes that like never really got their ending, so to speak. Because like Ghost Rider 2 ends and it sets up this whole other thing that uh, like a third movie that never happened like of a team of ghost Rider, and yeah it just never happened like that would have been mo much more compelling to me than seeing blade who did get an ending um and would have made more sense than a day walk when there are no vampires in this movie and there's no daredevil in this movie uh and they kind of even make a joke about it which seems more ill-timed uh now uh because it's obviously a joke about ben affleck and he now he's just going through another divorce. So a divorce joke kind of a little um, a little soon for that. But granted, they probably filmed this like a year ago uh, or maybe even two. But anyways, that's what's I the point. But yeah, I think in terms of cameos, I, I would have actually preferred, preferred uh, it to focus on the people who didn't get an ending. Because I think that's what the movie wants to do, right? Is here's the ending for these Fox characters that really never got a chance or um, to finish their story. Yeah. I've got, I've got nothing else to add except, uh, except what I said. I just, yeah, I, I don't think the cameos are particularly, particularly good. And, and it just, I don't know. I feel, I, I feel, I feel pretty defeated watching a movie that's just driven by cameos and has nothing else to offer beyond just, you know, how many people can you recognize in a film? And it's, it kind of falls flat on its face. And, you know, I had a similar feeling with, um, not because of cameos or anything, uh, with it's something I'm dealing with right now with writing my Inside Out 2 review. I'm like, okay, do people really want to read my take on Inside Out 2? You know, it's like how many and uh, how many sequels can we do? Like we get 19 sequels next year. That's ridiculous to me. But, but yeah, I, I, I understand that aspect of it entirely. And even outside of the franchise fatigue, fatigue aspect of it. And I think we've already talked about this, but I'll go ahead and uh, do some quick questions real quick. Because I think we've already answered this. I want to talk about Deadpool and Wolverine specifically as two characters. And if, they, if the movie really even changed your perspective on the two characters and their respective... I mean, I don't think so. I think Deadpool pretty much stays the same. I just, I found the jokes this time around to be really tired and irritating compared to the first and second movie. And as far as Wolverine is concerned, I think Jackman's portrayal of the character is great. You know, he's always been great in, in all of the movies that he's been in. But um, this Wolverine, like I said, doesn't have any emotional attachment with the audience because it's just, it's just this random Wolverine that destroyed his universe. But, you know, it's not the Wolverine. It's not the Logan Wolverine. It's not, you know, not the, uh, the X Men. It's not the X Men. It's just a Wolverine. And it, you know, when you when you look at the movie that way, I just think it just doesn't really, you know, it, they're only using Wolverine to score some cheap nostalgia points and not necessarily create an actual story with with depth and you know, with with reverence for the character. It's just hey, Hugh Jackman's wearing the suit. You've always wanted to see him wear the suit. Here he is. He's wearing the suit. You know, get excited. Not and only that, though, he's also wearing the mask. Well, don't get me started. When he wore the mask, uh, oh boy, uh, that image is very, very, very unpleasant because the mask doesn't even look real. It looks completely yeah. CG. And the background, again, the, the, the background is completely artificial and it just doesn't, it doesn't hit as hard as it did when, for example, when Captain America held Mjolnir in Endgame. That's a very potent moment because it was unexpected and it felt Whereas now he's wearing a mask. It's like, oh, you've always seen him wearing a mask. Well, now here, here he is. Get excited. He's wearing a mask. You know, cool, I guess. But it doesn't really hit harder than that. Yeah. And to the mask aspect of it, I think the mask is too over-designed. Uh, like the wings and everything. Like, I think that's way too, the wings are way too big, in my opinion. But anyway, but 
but yeah as for how it changed uh my perspective on the characters i think it kind of made me crave another r-rated wolverine movie from um oh who directed um logan james and the wolverine james mungled I, I would love another uh wolverine movie from him um because I think now with Deadpool and Wolverine, he's kind of being shoehorned into this MCU box. And I get worried about that. Like there's a joke about like they're gonna Disney's gonna make him do it do this until he's 90. And I and given that we've seen uh Charles Xavier from the in the in the gold chair and Doctor Strange, uh Beast uh in the Marvels, um and a bunch of other X-Men characters. I do worry a bit about X-Men's place in the MCU. That it's just to serve the animated series fans, the Twitter users, or I'm sorry, X users, now that are like screaming about something not being lore accurate. Like Blu-ray Angel, who I've blocked on every single social <laughs> media known to man i got a jump scare a few weeks ago where he popped up on my tiktok and i immediately had to hit the don't show me videos from this creator option uh and soups that too that's that that's what this movie's catering to they're catering to people who have not read comics they just you know they make up fan theories online and they hope that it comes true like henry cavill is wolverine honestly it's like who wants to see that other than Blu-ray Angel and Soups because they've been clamoring about it for months, fan casting him as Wolverine, uh, you know? I, yeah, I wouldn't. And I guess I want to use that to kind of transition to how Deadpool and Wolverine kind of adapted for the MCU. Um, it, it does have, like I said earlier, I think it does have me concerned about the X-Men because, you know, we're talking about key jangling a lot. It has me worried that unlike Fantastic Four, where you have all these new actors for the roles that you're just going to be using the old actors, for uh, lack of a better term, in order to appease Blu-ray Angel and Soups and all these fan casts. Yeah, I don't... I don't. Or Camille Nanjiani as a booster gold. I saw that a week ago. That was an absolutely terrible casting. Oh, that's, not a, that's, not, a fan, that's, that's not a fan cast. I think that's true. Uh, I love Camille. Yeah. You were great in the big sick. Don't play Booster Gold, please. Yeah, I think I think that's true, because uh, yes. Peter Saffron's wife has been confirming it on Instagram. Fun. So yeah. Yeah, it just I I think I think the proliferation of here's the comic accurate stuff has me concerned about their place in the MCU. Because I mean, even Deadpool gets a more comic accurate suit in this movie, um, with a wider eye, um, and. And generally, just more comic accurate um, suit, and I'm just like, okay, comic accurate is cool. Yes, I, if it's at the expense of keeping the same actor, maybe we don't. Um, like keep Ryan Reynolds because I think he's to quote this movie, the anchor being, uh, which stupid concept. We already had like the whole idea of nexus beings in Wandavision, so like what. What anyway? Um, I I just hope that we don't get these same actors in the MCU. If that makes sense, I think I'll skip over talking about the fights because I think we're all pretty tired out from talking about those fights. The only one that really stands out is the van fight, um, and the Deadpool core fight, which immediately. That Deadpool core fight immediately after walking out of the theater, I was like, "Oh, so this is the movie's version of faceless uh, villains to kill, like uh, in the Ch the Chitari and the Avengers and the Ultron bots in the Avengers: Age of Ultron and uh, Thanos's army in uh, Infinity War." I could go on and on and on. It lacked impact, for lack of a better term. Because you knew, oh, these people are coming back uh, because, hey, they're Deadpool. So they have the regenerative healing factor, except for, well, Nice Pool, uh, which was kind of a weird character. But OK, fine. I don't really want to talk about the fourth wall. I mean, I, 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 I've also said what I wanted to say about the fourth wall breaks. But even then, I'm like, you know. I think I'm sort of unfazed by how just boring they've gotten. 
I don't know. Well, I don't know if that makes sense. It's just it. I don't know. It feels sinister when you have Disney, you know, that owns this movie. Or to talk about how you know bad the MCU has gotten feels. Yeah, I'm. I I I, I don't know who said. I don't know who said um, this, but you know, Disney patting themselves on the back about buying Fox to only to make themselves the butt of the joke feels a little a little weird. I have a theory about the synergistic jokes. Because do you know who one of the writers on this film is? Zeb Wells. Yeah, you you know exactly <laughs> where I'm going with this then. <laughs> like if for those who haven't read a comic, um Zeb Wells is the A the destroyer of relationships and probably one of the worst comic writers I've experienced. Yeah. Um in all my time reading comics and i'm not not saying that out of hyperbole what he has done to spider-man is unforgivable one more day (laughs) it's like the joke all my homies hate one more day but really i i think that's where a lot of the synergistic jokes come from because he wasn't a writer on any because i looked what when writing my review um, for Deadpool and Wolverine. I looked, and he's not, not written Deadpool 1, Deadpool 2, Once Upon a Deadpool, none of them. And it feels like the changes from the film either come from Shop Levy or um, Zeb Wells. But, um, but yeah, that's... And, and, like, the fourth wall breaks just felt more manufactured, if that makes sense. They felt like, oh, hey, now we're clearly going to do a fourth wall break um like you mentioned the multiverse and the state of the mcu uh joke and it's just like okay dude we get it we've been here a million times you haven't said a joke i haven't made in private so anyways the fourth wall breaks besides the one where he at the beginning was the only one where it's like okay that one made sense and there were a lot less of them too. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, oh, who knows? But I'm just gonna go ahead and blame Zeb Wells for that one because why not? Um, and uh, then let's talk about the villain slash antagonist Cassandra Nova and Mister Paradox. Um, other than being a baby girl, Mister Paradox uh is a waste of time in this movie. Um, like I. Like, I legitimately thought they were going to do something with him where it's going to be like Loki was going to come off the world tree, spoiler for Loki season two. Um, and um, just like, I don't know, or like Owen Wilson, somebody from Loki was going to be like, hey, I'm actually your boss and you need to stop it. Uh, or something, something that would have made sense with this character. Instead of like deliberately sending Cassandra Nova to the void and building an unsanctioned time ripper at MacGuffin device that clearly Cassandra Nova isn't even interested in until like the last what 30 minutes of the movie yeah because like there's a clear point where uh I mean there's a literal hopping off point at in this movie they hop off into a Doctor Strange-esque portal and the movie could have just left it there and had Cassandra Nova just exit the movie at that point and made Mr. Paradox the actual villain. But then it says, no, 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 we paid too much of Emma Corrin's salary to let her go. We need her for one more scene. So, so yeah, uh, that, that's my thoughts. Do you have any thoughts, Dad? Uh, I think Cassandra Nova is a, is a completely wasted villain. Um, I, I don't I think Emma Corrin's a pretty pretty good actor, but they have nothing to do with in this movie. Just you know, it's a villain because it feels like Marvel's in desperate need of a villain to have an emotional anchor. But again, you know, the villain is in the void. The void is completely meaningless when it comes to the overarching uh, MCU, and the motivations that the character has are fairly paper thin and don't really, I guess. You know, they're there, they exist, but they're completely unimportant. And as far as Mr. Paradox goes, I do like Matthew McFadden. I think he's a good actor, and he's pretty good in this movie. He's having fun. He seems to have fun. 
Yeah. But he's a fodder. He's a fodder for exposition. All he does is deliver exposition after exposition. And once he's done delivering exposition, you know, they posit him as a bad guy. And uh, it falls uh, it falls flat uh, once again. Yeah, and and I think that's the decision where I think the decision to make him set in the TVA was a big mistake because a lot of people watch Loki. So they have those expectations of like, oh, he works for the TVA. So let me see um, Kiwe Kwan. Let me see uh, all these other characters that I know from the Loki show. And then it's just like, no, no, we're not going to do that. And in fact, he's so rogue that he, he's like in the basement or something. I don't know. It, it, it was very weird. It was very weird to have the TVA in this movie at all, actually, other than to serve the purpose of getting him to the void. Um, but in that uh, sense, talking about the void, I want to flip back to the Johnny Storm cameo um, because it has something to do with the end credit scene. What do you think of it? Eh, it's fine. Yeah. Probably the most harmless point of the movie for me. Uh, there's nothing really, you know, uh, that... You know, it's not that important. It's funny, I guess. You know, Chris Evans is having fun, which is which is always great. But uh, I don't know. It, you know, it's it's there. It exists. There's an end credit scene in a in a in a Marvel movie. It's 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 part of the course, but it's you know, probably one of their weakest. Yeah, which is weird because I, I like, I don't know if you were looking at all any of the coverage uh, Brian Reynolds was doing for this movie. I think he said explicitly, like, hey, we're not going to be doing any of those typical Marvel stuff at the end of our credits. And it's like, but you did do that. So were you just lying woefully? Uh, it was weird. It, that that whole part was weird to me, other than the whole X-23 cameo. Um, so, But um, I, I think a better end credit scene is actually lying inside of that end credit scene. Have you heard the theory? Uh, no. So... Gambit is on one of the screens in the TVA, like showing oh, yeah. him alone. Oh, yeah. I've heard I think it, yeah. that would have made a better end credit scene of it. Uh, Gambit coming back to his universe or something, and just like nobody was there. And he's like, I'm alone again or something. Like just a quick joke or something. Would have been better, I guess, than just having Chris Evans do the same thing he did in Knives Out, where he just has this long monologue about how he hates this one uh, group of people. Um, so, um, but other than that, um, I guess the only way to go is uh, forward. Um, where do you think the respective universe, X-Men, uh, Deadpool, the MCU, um, go from here? I'm really excited for X-Men 97 season two. Uh, that's what I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, I think this is going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with the live action uh, iteration of the characters, but uh, I think we'll, you know, this will not be the last that we're going to see of Deadpool. Uh, and I think uh, and Wolverine. I think Hugh Jackman is coming back for Avengers Doomsday or Avengers Secret Wars. Yeah, and, there's even uh, like a comic cover in the movie. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see. We'll we'll see what happens there. But uh, I don't want to make too too outlandish theories we'll we'll see we'll see how the story how the story plays out but uh, x-men 97 season two is going to be great yeah I, I i hope to catch up with x-men 97 by then uh but um i think i've kind of already said my piece on where i think the universes are going to go i think they're going to go even further into the x-men animated series where the, we just keep getting uh who'd be next or would be next so maybe we get alexandra ship from the x-men movies like the prequel movies um and then uh the um not mysterio nightcrawler from x-men dark phoenix and then we'll just get like all the people from the other x-men movies as the new x-men um but this time comic accurate suits uh, because that seems to be the if and of this uh adaptation of the mcu's x-men um, as for where Deadpool goes, um, I hope he goes in the direction Guardians of the Galaxy did, where he's so devoid of the MCU that he's a, it's almost his own franchise. So uh, with that said, um, that concludes our uh, discussion on Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, if 
you, the audience member, uh, have anything you'd like to discuss about the film, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on my Blue Sky Facebook, Instagram threads. Uh, I'm there under the username Austin B Media. Uh, I have my own very own Discord, which I have in the episode description and the YouTube description. Uh, and obviously, there's the Patreon uh, community chat, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later when I plug my Patreon. Uh, I'm also on Letterbox at as Austin B Media, uh, not Austin B Media. I'm also on Letterbox as Austin B Movie. Um, and thank you, Max Ants, for joining me in discussing Dick World Wolverine. Uh, where can people follow you on social media? Well, uh, all my social media is Max from Quebec, so you can just find me anywhere on all social media with the same handle. Uh, yeah, I am so jealous because I like, mean, I mean, it's, it's it's the you know you have to. Yeah, it has to be the same, otherwise people get confused. I know, it's just like, I'm glad I'm not on Twitter anymore. In fact, I made my tweets protected last uh, weekend um, because I'm not really on there active anymore. Um, but on there, it was Austin B Media underscore. I had to add an underscore at the end because somebody had at Austin B Media. But I might change my letterbox username to Austin B Media. That actually makes more sense. Um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'll make sure to include all those links in the description. Um, and uh, for those uh, listening or watching at home, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, please subscribe, leave a rating, uh, and review it on your favorite podcast app. I think uh, I think uh, Spotify or YouTube just enabled in-app ratings. Uh, don't or no, it was Pocket Casts that just enabled in-app ratings. Um, I that was on the release notes this week. Um, on the app store, um, which I also recommend. I love pocket casts. Anyways, that said, uh, if you'd like to hear the next episode before it goes live on podcast services, uh, check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Austin B Media, where you can subscribe for as little as $3 a month or $10 a month to get unedited podcast episodes like this one, as well as it as exclusive podcast episodes. I think um, I'm the two bonus ones I'm doing this year, this month, are the fall 2024 preview, hidden gem, um, a bunch of stuff like that um, are what you can expect from bonus episodes. So with that, I've been your host, Austin Belzer. And until next time.